Let's move on to question 34. A study was conducted to determine the number of cars that pass through two intersections each day for 20 days. The results are summarized in these box and whisker plots. If you remember from your study statistics, your teachers should have gone over this here. This is basically four, you know, different quarters here. From here, that's the beginning, that's quarter one data, that's the middle data, and here is quarter three and then quarter four. All right. So let's see here which statement is best supported by these data let's look at one the range of the data for intersection two is twice the range of the data for intersection one okay intersection one the data seems to range from 350 the minimum to 550 the maximum so between 350 and 5 that's 200 that's the range for intersection one Let's look at intersection two. Looks like it ranges from 250 to 650. So 250 to 650 is 400. Well, that is double the range. The range doubles for intersection two than intersection one. So A, that's our answer. Boom, that was easy. But just to double check, just to make sure, let's look at the other answer choices. The lower quartile for intersection one is greater than the lower quartile for intersection two. Well, you can look here, intersection two, lower quartile, is way greater than intersection one, so that's not right. The interquartile range for intersection one is the same as the interquartile range for intersection two. Interquartile range basically means this part here from quarter one to quarter three, quarter three to quarter one. Now, you can look at two and see that this is much larger than intersection two. So that's not right. And let's see, D. The total number of vehicles that pass through intersection two is greater than the total number of vehicles that pass through intersection one. Well, this is an It doesn't tell you exactly how many. I mean, yeah, you see this minimum and max on certain days, but it doesn't tell you exactly how many cars pass totally for the 20 days. You can't very well ascertain that. I mean, one day it could have been 650 cars. Another day it could have been 600. You don't know. So D is not right. So A is the only one that makes sense. Okay, let's go on to number 35. Which of these functions has exactly two different zeros? Well, graphing, I said you can graph or factor. You have two options here. Now, I graphed each one just to check, and then I also factor. Now, if you graph one, matter of fact, let me just do it for you right now. So I know because I bet some of you don't even believe me when I'm doing this here. So let's clear this, and let's go here and clear this out. So the first one is f of x equals 1 over 10x plus 4. So we graph that. That's our graph. And nope, there are no two different zeros there. So that doesn't make it. So let's look at the next one. Clear this out. I'm just going to put it in parentheses. 3x minus 10. And divided by 3. And we graph that. And, well, yeah, that has an x-intercept and a y-intercept. So technically, that's two zeros. But that's not what they They want two different x zeros, not an x and a y. So that's not going to work. All right, so let's look at choice C. Clear that out. We have x squared minus 4x plus 4. We graph that. And we see, oh, well, there's only 1x. Because if you factor this, it factors to be x minus 2 times x minus 2. There are two zeros, but the zeros are exactly the same. 2. So it's just one zero. So that's not it. Now let's try choice D. Graph that. X squared plus 11X 
plus 24. And we graph that. Oh, looky here. We have one, two different zeros. Two different, and then if we factor this, because this is a trinomial coefficient of one, so two numbers that add up to positive 11 and multiply to 24, eight and three, x and three. Those are our two different zeros. Choice D is the answer. Okay, capiche? All right, let's go on to question 36. In which table does y vary directly with x? So y equals kx, so it's going to be upward here. Now, you should be able to just look at it and see, but if, if you can't do that, we can go through them individually. Here, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 3. Let me just clear this out here. And then... Now, if you can imagine, well, let me get rid of this here. Let me go here to Y1, get rid of this here. Now, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 3, that's just a straight line going across the Y. That's not anything varying. Now, here you should notice, if I do 1 times 4, I get 4. 2 times 4, I get that. 3 times 12, this gives you a y equals 4x, which is a direct variation, okay? Because if I multiply each x by 4, that gives me my y. That's a direct variation. Well, if you look at c and d, you don't get that. So b is your answer. You can either put this into stat, each one of these, and then calculate and graph it, but this one was rather simple. I can look at it and see if I multiply by 4 each time here, I get my direct variation. So B is our answer. Let's go on to 37. Which equation could represent a graph with x-intercepts of positive 4, 0, negative 7, 0? Easiest way, punch each of them in and find out. So we start with our first one here. Now if I go to y, punch in x squared x squared plus 3x minus 28. We graph it. And hmm, lo and behold, I get 1, 2, 3, 4. That's 4, 0. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative, negative 7, 0. Our first one. Boom. That's it. We don't need to do the other three. Our first one matches the graph. Okay, on to question 38. Which number is a zero of the function h? So h of x is x squared plus 3x minus 18. Well, we could graph it or we could factor it. Well, factoring, here's a trinomial coefficient of one so we need two numbers that add to positive 3, multiply to negative 18. Factors of 18 are 18 and 1, 9 and 2, 6 and 3. Out of those, 6 and 3 meet our criteria, x plus 6, x minus 3. Because 6 minus 3 does give me a positive 3, and then 6 times negative 3 does give me a negative 18. So this factors to x plus 6 times x minus 3. If we set both of these equal to 0, well, x here will be negative 6, x here will be positive 3. If we punch this in on calculator, and we see here a negative 6 and a positive 3, 4, 0. Now we look at our answer choices. Negative 6 is our answer choice A. So there we go. Boom, that one's done. On to question 39. Which of the following graphs appears to be a function. Now, if you remember from class, in order for a graph to be a function, it has to pass the vertical line test, which means if you take a vertical line and run it across the function, at most, it should only touch your vertical line at one point. If it touches your vertical line at one point, it's not a function, it's merely a relation. Looking at each of these four graphs, if I were to take a vertical line go across here, well, we see it touches the vertical line and more than one point on several occasions for A, 
we see it will touch a vertical line in more than one occasion for C, and we see it touch a vertical line more than one occasion on D. Only in B, if I were to run a vertical line, an up and down line, straight across the graph, at most, it touches my graph in only one point. So B is the only function here. Okay? Okay, we're getting down to the Y. Question 40 here. If f of x equals x minus 3 squared plus 1, what is f of 6? So I just rewrote f of x equals x minus 3 squared plus 6. Now, when it says f of 6, wherever you see an x, just substitute in a 6. So f of 6 equals 6 minus 3 squared plus 1. 6 minus 3 is 3. 3 squared plus 1. 3 squared is 9. 9 plus 1 is 10. Option C. All right, boom, you're done. Let's go on. Which number is not an element in the domain of this relation? Now, you remember domain are simply your x values. So my x values are negative 2, 0, 1, and 6, which I've written here. So I just look at my answer choices here. 4 is not included in the domain, so 4 is my answer here. Okay, that one's pretty simple. Let's go on question 42. We're entering the home stretch, people. Okay, using the equation of the line of best fit, which number is the best prediction of the output when the input is 13? Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to go back to our calculator. We're going to go to stat, edit. We're going to input these numbers. Let me clear this out first. Let me go up. Clear, enter. The first numbers we're going to enter in L1 for our X's. The second numbers we're going to enter in L2 for our Y's. So, negative 5, enter. 2, enter. 9, enter. 11, enter. 0, enter. 5, enter. So those are our X's. Now our Y's, 9, 31, 143, 151, 42, 97. Okay, so we have our data entered. We're going to hit stat, calc, and we're going to do linear regression first, all right? So option four, linear regression and calculate. Now, this is what I want you to do. At store reg EQ, which we did earlier, I want you to hit the VARS key, right arrow over to Y VARS, hit function and one. Because whatever function you get is going to store in Y1. We need that so that we can answer what the input is at 13. Okay? Now, calculate. So when we calculate, we get uh, y equals 9.78, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, the R correlation code for 0.96. That's fairly close to 1, so we can kind of rely on that. Now, look, the question asks us, which number is the best prediction of the output when the input is 13? Okay. So if I went over to y1, that is basically the equation. Now, I want to know what the input is when it's 13. I'm not going to graph it, but what I am going to do is I'm going to hit my second tape graph because I want to know what the input is at 13. So when x is 13, let me go down. When x is 13, it says that y is 170.15. So, C, 170, that's the best prediction. One, okay, so again, what we did was we entered the data in uh, stat edit. Then we did the linear regression. We stored that particular data to put it into Y1 to graph it, but we don't need to graph it. We just need to go to the table and look at the data values. And at 13, we get 170.16, blah, blah, blah. So 170 is our best predictor. Okay, 
Question 43. A data set has a mean of 720 and a standard deviation of 6, which is closest to the z-score for an element of this data set with a value of 709. Now, from your statistics unit, you should remember to find the z-score, the formula is z equals x sub i, which is your data set, minus your mu, which is your mean, divided by sigma, your standard deviation. So, it says the data set, the value is 709. So, it's equal 709 minus the mean. The mean is 720. So, 709 minus 720 divided by the standard deviation. They say the standard deviation is 6. So, 709 minus 720 is negative 11. So, negative 11 divided by 6. So, let me clear this. And if I do that on calculator, negative 11 divided by 6 negative 1.83, which is answer choice D. Okay, so that's how we find the z-score. Okay, we're at the end here. Question 44. Ramon drew box and whisker plots to summarize the number of pages in each chapter of two books. The values of the interquartile ranges for these box and whisker plots are the same. Which box and whisker plots could represent this data? Well, from statistics, you need to remember what interquartile range is. Interquartile range is equal to the third quarter minus the first quarter. So from here to here, minus that. All right. So let's look at A. Let's see. So the interquartile range, well, Q3, quarter three is at 35 here. Quarter one is at 20 here. 35 minus 20, that's 15. Let's look at book two. Quarter three is at 30. Quarter one is at 15. 30 minus 15 is 15. They match. Boom, that's it. So A is our answer. We're done. But just to check it, let's just check the others. So here we have 35 for book one. Here, quarter three. And quarter one here, 10. 35 minus 10 that's uh, 25. Let's look at book two. We have 35 minus 15. That's 20. They don't match, so B can't be our answer. Let's look here. Quarter three is at 30. Quarter one is at 10. So that's 20. 30 minus 10 is 20. Here we have quarter three at 40. 15, that's 25. They don't match, so C can't be it. And then look at D. So quarter three is at 30. And quarter one is at 20, so that's 10. Here, quarter three is at 35. And then quarter one is at 20. That's 15. They don't match. So the only one that matches is A for the interquartile range. All righty then. So that is all 44 questions of the quarter one test item set for Algebra 1 Spring 2015. I suggest that you look at these again, and again, if the ways that I solve them, you know, aren't uh, hot for you, and your teacher showed you another way, use their ways, but you should be able to answer all of these questions, and you should be able to answer all of the questions on the Algebra 1 SOL. Good luck. Have a great day.